And it's six o'clock. Michael, can I hand over to you? You certainly can. Um, I'll try and admit people at the same time if I can. Uh, so firstly, I'd like to really thank uh, all of the participants uh, for coming online for our first uh, WWW and certainly to Lynn uh, for giving up her time and putting this together for us tonight. We're really honoured to have uh, you do so, Lynn. Um, Learning Difficulties Australia, uh, many of you obviously will be members. Uh, some of you may not be members. Uh, on the screen there, you can see uh, what we do. And I think uh, we're an organisation that um, is incredibly important uh, for education in Australia. And uh, our, our aim is to really uh, improve teaching practices based on scientific research and, and to grow and to do that um, more in the coming months and years. And certainly uh, these sessions are going to be a, a fixture um, for the remainder of this year and, and hopefully off into the future. Uh, we've got David Morkunis next week talking about uh, space practice and interleaving. Um, I do apologise that we haven't promoted that yet. The reason being we've had a lot of difficulty uh, upgrading our licence with Zoom and um, that's been an ongoing problem. So it's highly likely that the next one David will re record and uh, we'll have a YouTube channel that it will go up uh, at 6 p.m. next Wednesday. So we will be putting out uh, the rest of the um, scheduled speakers for the remainder of the term uh, and then next term uh, for the remainder of the year. So we do have some great speakers, local and international coming. We thought we'd start with one of the very best uh, with Lynn. Um, so uh, I'll hand over to Lynn and, and thanks so much again, Lynn, and, and also to everybody and enjoy the session today. Huge pleasure. Thank you so much, Michael. And I've actually stopped sharing my screen. Um, and I just realized that I can, while I've got my um, PowerPoint going, that I can let people in. So I, I let a whole load of people in while you were talking. Exciting. But there's more in the waiting room. We're past the 100 mark already. I'm letting them in. Absolutely super. Just a couple of admins before we start. Um, if you could possibly, uh, I love to see your faces, so keep your cameras on because I love that. But if you could possibly switch off your mics, that would be really good because what happens when we have multiple people, even tiny, tiny noises in your background will, um, will make it really clicky and feedbacky, if that's a word. Um, so if you possibly can, turn off your mics and, um, and then, uh, you know, it'll, it'll be quite smooth. There is a chat function if you look down, uh, just a tiny, tiny Zoom 101, I'm sure you're all experts, but there is a chat function and uh, in that you can message me, you can message the whole room, you can message each other privately, but what you should know about that is that, that, that chat, the transcript of that, goes onto my computer afterwards. So. I'm not really going to be combing the chat, but just so you know, I could see what you're saying to one another in chat. So if you don't want me to see that, you probably just text each other. That's probably the best thing because I might see it. Um, so there, so there you go. I um I will be doing a, a PowerPoint presentation. I'm going back and forth, sharing my screen uh, back and forth. Michael will be looking at the chat questions. If there's a burning question coming up, I'd be really happy to answer it. But also down in your, um, again, where your control panel is, there is a way of uh, raising your hand. And at the end, this has been working really well in my, my webinars on spelling. At the end, what, what we've been doing with that webinar is that people have been putting their hands up and then we've been going one by one and taking their mics um, off again or unmuting their mics and then there's a sort of system there where I can answer your questions one by one So I'm going to do that at the end. So yes, somebody's already got their hand up. That is brilliant I'm not going to stop the presentation if you've got your hand up if it's something where you need me to stop and Answer a question <laughs> and sometimes that happens Then if you could type that in the chat Michael will interrupt me. Is that all right, Michael? Sure. Yes, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, because I'd like I'm I'm really happy to be interactive, um, but there's too much going on if there's hands up and mics on and all that sort of thing during the actual presentation. I do hope that's all right with everyone. 
can see some nodding. All right, fantastic. So let's begin. Gosh, I'm just looking at all the faces here and uh, so many lovely people, so many familiar faces. It's so nice to see you. Um, let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. So sharing my screen with you now and you should be able to see uh, the last slide that Michael was speaking about. Just by way of introduction to me, I'm a linguist in private practice. I write books about education, especially about reading and spelling and writing and that sort of thing. I'm also a school consultant, so schools contact me and ask me uh, to, um, to help them raise the, the standard of, of literacy instruction and, and other things in their school, and I do my best to do that. Um, as a result of all of that, I get to see what children are asked to work with sorry, to ask, ask to work on in school and at other practices. So I see their homework, I see, um, you know, what, uh, what, what, they're, what, what they're being asked to do. And I see a lot of the language around how children are being taught and the, the, the sort of um, the trends in, in, in what works best for the children that I work with and what doesn't work for them. And that's why I've got that picture of the canary because I do I say to teachers, we're all in the coal mine, but I have to look after the canaries. So those are the ones for whom those are the bellwethers, the one who, uh, to mix my metaphors there, the ones who show uh, when best practice is working and when low quality practice uh, isn't working. And so that then uh, leads me to have conversations with educator about educators about how we can get a better deal for those children. And that's certainly something in line with the aims of LDA too. One thing that comes up quite consistency, consistently is inconsistency. So when I see their work, I see all kinds of meta language. I see all sorts of uh, words and terms um, that are inconsistent. They, they range not just between schools, but uh, between classrooms, between teachers. One year, uh, a student's asked to do a certain thing. The next year, they're asked to do something in completely different terms. And it's quite striking, especially for the children that I work with, because they need consistency. <laughs> they, they need meta-language that's consistent from the beginning and very, very clear if they're going to achieve the aims of, uh, of, of, of school, which is to be at least literate and numerate. So, if we're going to carry out the aims of LDA, it's, it, 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 it sort of strikes me, and those aims are assisting students with learning difficulties through effective practices based on scientific research. Um, if we're going to do that, we need to be really, really clear. Now, the thing I want to be clear about at the beginning of this is that I'm not interested in ridiculing people for using wrong terms. I'm not, or unclear terms. I'm not interested in being elitist. I'm not interested in jargon that keeps other people out. Um, you know, so if you don't know what a non-lexical vocable is, that's fine with me. I didn't know that either until I had to research it for a live radio interview this, this afternoon. Big deal. I don't, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to be using esoteric terms and keeping people out. My goal, though, is inclusion. And not just for teachers and other professionals, but for those canaries in the coal mine, those whose life chances depend on high quality instruction. And it all starts with language. Now, I'm reminded of a situation that kind of inspired me to, to, um, to want to put together this presentation. And that was a, a, a recent situation um, on social media. I'll tell you how it unfolded. But to start with, I don't know a lot about neuroscience or psychology. Those aren't my fields, but I'm keen to be guided on useful terms from any discipline because it helps me get a better deal for, for, for vulnerable kids. So my linguistics background allows me to have a bit of knowledge about the structure of language, and that's what I want to talk about tonight. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the kind of debates that can rage on social media in response to simple, innocent questions. And I'm going to use a recent one on a well-populated education page. And a teacher asked a simple question. She said something like, how many syllables are in the word oil? That led to quite a, an interesting reaction. There were a hundred comments, um, which is quite a lot in social media. And some of those comments were excellent. There are a lot of educators out there that really know what they're talking about and they can communicate it really, really well. Um, some of the answers weren't 
excellent. They weren't spectacular. There was an educator who talked about the word having an IPA of. And look, again, IPA, that's etched on my heart. It's one of the things I can talk about. And I, and I think that's a good starting point um, for, for some of the terms that I would like to go over tonight, if that's all right with you. Um, the IPA, let's start there. That's the International Phonetic Alphabet. And again, I'm sure you all know exactly what I'm talking about. That's not the point. But the point I think we need to get across as members of LDA and as advocates and people who have contact with large groups of educators is that the IPA is a chart. It's a chart, right? It's just a chart. It has symbols on that chart. And those symbols are placed on the chart according to how they're produced. Yep, to, according to how we say them. It's a reference tool. So it's a chart. It is not an all-knowing judge of how to pronounce English words, right? That's not what the IPA is. So if you're debating how uh, many syllables are in a word, for instance, or how you would say a certain combination of letters, the IPA itself is not going to tell you that. There may be a dictionary that uses IPA notation and the higher quality the dictionary, the more variance it will give you uh, using the IPA, but it's not the judge of how we say things. So that's the first thing. I think we, we, we need to be, we need to, there, there, there's a few products on the market there that are using IPA symbols and that's really, really good. But if you're going to use those symbols, I think you need to do IPA 101 with the people that you're training so that we don't get this kind of, I don't know, muddy um, view of the IPA. Here it is. Here's the clear view of the IPA. And the reason I'm showing that to you, um, and, and I'm sure it's familiar to lots and lots of you, it's a thing of deep beauty, or maybe I'm biased. I might be showing my, my linguistics bias, but I actually have a poster of this and I look at it all the time and it gets updated and it's just beautiful. But anyway, to the IPA, what I want to just really, we're, we're, not, we're not doing a PD on the International Phonetic Alphabet, but what I want to show you is that all of these symbols represent human speech sounds and there's only a few that represent the sounds of English because we don't say all the speech sounds. That would be crazy. Every language kind of has its, its, its system and that is the vowels and consonants within that system and in fact every dialect within every language has its own vowel and consonant system and in fact every individual well, they have their idiolect where they have their own vowel system and their own consonant system and it varies between people. But anyway, this chart, this beautiful chart, I want to just use it to get, uh, to transcribe a word. The word is the place where Nessie lives, right? Where does she live? Where does Nessie live? Can you think of the, and don't tell me she doesn't live because she does, right? Where does Nessie live? Have you thought of the place? It's a place, it's a lake, and it's a, it's a little bit like lake ness, but it's this word here, the word before ness. So I want you to think about that. How would you transcribe the word ness? No, rubbish. The word, the, the word before ness, I'm not going to say it, right? We all agree on how to transcribe ness, I think. I don't think there's too much variation there. But if we go back to the IPA, let's look at the first sound in that word, which is l. So we have a lateral approximant here, l. And then there's a vowel. And in, we'd probably be agreed that we're down here with a back rounded o um, vowel. So this is the vowel quadrilateral, which tells us how, how vowels are placed and rounding and so on from the IPA. And then it's the third phoneme that I'm really interested in. What would you choose? What would you choose? If I'd um, thought, about, thought about it in time, I'd have actually created a poll for you. Choose, what's the third phoneme in this word that goes before Ness, where Nessie lives? What did you all choose, I wonder? Well, most of you, I'm imagining, because I think I'm speaking to um, Australians, most of you would have chosen a velar plosive. So velar means that you've got your soft palate, 
that's the back of your mouth there, and you're making an exploding sound by building up air between your, uh, the back of your tongue and your palate, and you're going like that. Yep, Loch Ness. But I'm Scottish, and actually I use a velar fricative there. I say loch, and so I don't explode that sound out, I hiss it out. It's a fricative for me. So therefore, if I were transcribing Loch Ness, I would transcribe it differently from you because transcription is about the transcriber. And I think that's what we, sorry, I heard someone say something. Was that a question, Michael? Nope. Fair enough. All right. <laughs> Everybody's saying Loch. Yes, I am biased. It's true. Um, everybody's saying Loch. I'm just looking at the chat to make sure. Yeah. Loch. Loch. Oh, who said that? Somebody said that really beautifully. Pam. Pam. Was, that, was that Anne? Pam. Pam? Pam. Oh, do you say Loch? Loch. Because you are respectful, right, of the, the way that Scott say it, I'm imagining. Is that why? Or, or Yes, and I'm also Pam McGregor, so that's Scotch. <laughs> Oh, it's as Scottish as it comes. Yes. Exactly. Very good. Well, I'm glad. We have some velar fricatives and some velar plosives. But there you go. Transcription's about the transcriber. So nothing has an IPA of, um, <laughs> apart from in the, you know, in the dialect of the, the, the transcriber. Of course, a dictionary is going to give you, uh, a, a, you know, the standard version uh, of, of the pronunciation within the country of origin of that dictionary. So we've got three major Anglophone dictionaries. We've got, you know, the, the Webster's in the United States, we've got the Oxford uh, in the UK, and we've got the Macquarie here, and they have, they have different um, pronunciation guides. Of course they do. So that's that. Transcription's about the transcriber. That's the first thing. The next thing, though, oh, Monica says, I don't pronounce version the same as you do. Fair enough. I know, we don't, none of us do. Um, the next thing though, the next thing that someone said during this kind of argument about how many syllables in oil, um, somebody said, uh, the vowel sound in question is a diphthong. Now, this is a picture of a diphthong. Yep, yeah? so it's dip and a thong here, diphthong. I think it's important, I think this word is important to get right, and I think this word is important to advocate about. The word that they were aiming to say was diphthong, as opposed to monophthong. So di means to, and thong, which is hard to say, I can understand why you would revert to dip, means sound or voice. So a diphthong has two places of articulation, and a monophthong is one place of articulation for a vowel. Going on to articulation, that's about three things. And I think it's important to get the idea about diphthongs and monophthongs as well by looking at what articulation actually is. You can classify any human speech sound via three, asking, by asking three questions. Basically, they differ from one another in three or combination of three ways. There's voicing. So if you say, um, in the way that some of you pronounce loch, if you say k, that's a voiceless consonant at the end. But if you say g, like in the word log, you've got lock and log now. What we have is a minimal pair that differs only in voicing of that final consonant. So articulation is about voice. It's about placing. It's about what moved when you made that sound. Where was it? Was it at the front of your mouth with your lips? It was it, um, you know, at the back of your mouth with your uvula? Where, where did you make that sound? And then how did you make that sound? Because we both made a velar consonant at the end of loch, but I made it fricative, I made it hissy, and you, a lot of you, would make it plosive, you'd make it an explosion sound. So articulation is about three things. Now with vowels, a diphthong is still one impulse of your voice, but it's two places. So some very common diphthongs would be ow. I think we all agree that that's a diphthong. So you go ow with your mouth smiley first and then your mouth round. And um, another one that we all agree on is oi, like in the target word we're talking about. So oi starts round and becomes smiley afterwards. Um, but some diphthongs we don't agree on, again, depending on your vowel system. 
depending on what's in your pantry of vowels that you use. So in Australia, uh, when, when you say the alphabet, how do you say the first letter of the alphabet? What's your, how do you say it? Say it out loud. You don't have to turn your mic on, but say it out loud for yourself. So the first letter of the alphabet, what's its name? And I would say A, right? And you may, in, with an Australian accent, accent, actually have a diphthong pronunciation for that. You might go A, and you start off open and become smiley, whereas I don't, it's a monothong for me. So again, it's dependent on your vowel system, whether we have a diphthong or a monothong. Then a whole bunch of people said it's two syllables. Oil is two syllables. So if we're going to count the syllables in words, we need to have a working knowledge of this thing called sonorance, where your vocal tract is open, and obstruents, where your vocal tract is, something's getting in the way of the sound coming out. We can measure sonorants and obstruents using spectrographic equipment. And I know that that sounds really technical, right? But I wanna show you my handheld spectrograph right now, okay? And you've all probably got one. Are you ready? Can you see me? Hey Siri. Boom, bada boom, bada boom, bada boom, bada boom, bada boom, bada boom. Look at that, I've got a spectrograph. <laughs> Right? It's measuring the sonority. Yeah, it's measuring this, this sonority. It's measuring how open my vocal tract is and it's showing that using these, um, these signals. Isn't that cool? You've got one in your hand. So that show, it, so when, those, when, those, um, when you've got those peaks there, that's your old vocal tract nice and open. And when you don't have those peaks, well, that's your vocal tract closed in some way. And roughly, we can divide those things into vowels and consonants, right? Roughly, we can divide them into vowels and consonants. So back to screen share for a secchi. Hopefully, I'm able to do that efficiently. Um, so we can measure sonority um, using spectrographic equipment. And spectrographic analysis is one of the most widely used techniques for studying the acoustic and phonetic characteristics of different phonemes and language, and it's actually quite fascinating. So there's our rough spectrograph there. But when you um, measure sonority, when you measure these peaks, you can have that printed out on a, a sonogram, right? So a syllable, and this is where the arguments broke out as well, and I think we should all know this, a syllable, is a voice impulse that can be preceded or followed, right, by a sequence of segments. So, um, but it's the impulse of the highest sonority, right? So it can have other uh, impulses. It can have, it can show up as other things with less sonority as it goes on. So the very middle of that impulse is is the the the, the nucleus of your syllable, right? And that and a syllable can be followed and preceded by other things. The peak of a syllable is often a vowel, often not always. And actually, there are some linguists who have a who place these uh, these sounds in a hierarchy of sonority. But certain consonants can also be that impulse. They can have that peak sonority. So they're known as syllabic consonants. So if you try saying the final syllable in the word chasm or rhythm or bottle, you'll see that you have two syllables in each word and the second syllable is a consonant. There's a consonant that's making that peak. You could try it with Siri right now and measure your sonority of each of those syllables, right? So syllables are actually about peaks. Peaks show sonor sonority, syllabic consonants are sonorant, right? And diphthongs are also quite high up on the sonority scale. So if you place a diphthong next to a syllabic consonant, like oil, all hell breaks loose. And that's, again, why I think we need to um, be really clear about the terms that we're using. Because then all these amazing theories came out during this, this chat about, oh, um, it's one this and two that and so on. It's all about sonority. And that's actually easy to, to, um, to convey to students as well. So the other thing about all of these arguments and the meta language that, that, um, that we use, the language we use to talk about language, is 
how you say it as an adult with your completely intact vowel system and consonant system is not as important as how the person you're teaching says it. So there may be variation between how you say it and how your student says it. So it varies between people, but it doesn't vary within individual systems. So if they say soil, oil, oil, yep, to rhyme with royal, then they will say all the oil words like that. Me, I, I have a different system. I would say soil, one peak, royal, two peaks. They vary between people, but not with systems. So then you would, um, if you were teaching me, want to separate those two families. I hope that makes sense. So yes, somebody said it rhymes with royal. Well, maybe for you it does, but you have to check with the people that you're teaching. You have to check with the people that you're teaching. Um, so how many syllables in royal in your system? I'd be really interesting to really interested to see. You can actually we can actually do some um, votes on this. Do you say two syllables for royal or not? Does it rhyme with oil? I don't know, but I would want to make sure that the kids I'm teaching, I want to make sure I know what they're saying so that I can group those words together. <laughs> yep, lots of verses. Oh, sorry, not sorry, not royal. Um, there are very few people, I think, that would say that with one peak, right? Royal. Kind of hard to say it. I'd have to force that out. What I meant was soil. One peak or two? I don't know, but, <laughs> but we, we need to find out from the, uh, from the people that we're actually teaching what they say and teach to that. Yeah, lots of votes for two, lots of votes for one. Royal and royal are homophones for me. I know, Monica, they're not for me, though. Royaling good time. Um, all right, so while we're on the subject of two things, though, there's another thing that I want to talk, talk to you about. So there was diphthongs, but also, and now we're, we're off that subject of, of oil and so on. I won't go back to that conversation, um, but I, I'll happily have the conversation here. While we're on the subject of two, di means two, just like in diphthong and graph, well, that means a thing which is written. So I see some misconceptions around the meaning, the pronunciation, the spelling, and the use of the term digraphs. So I want to do a really quick thing on this, and um, these slides will be available for you as well afterwards uh, as a PDF. So digraphs, two letters used to represent one sound, and it's st people start mixing them up with diphthongs. Digraphs are to do with the written language. Diphthongs are to do with spoken language. Um, it comes from Greek di meaning twice and graph meaning something written. So we also in that family have dichotomy, uh, which is a division or contrast between two things. Um, or we have dilemma, a difficult choice between two things. Uh, we have dioxide, an oxide containing two atoms. Um, of oxygen and its molecule, or we have diphthong, a sound formed by the combination of two vowels in a single syllable. So, and then we have graph, like biography, autograph, photograph, and so on. So those are digraphs. Now, a lot of the time, I see diagraph. Now this, the picture that I'm showing you on the slideshow here, that's a diagraph. That is a diagraph. We were talking about digraphs, but there is a thing called a diagraph. A diagraph is an instrument for drawing objects without the need for artistic skill. It's a stencil cutter. Um, it comes from dia, meaning through or in different directions or between, and graph. Yep, so we have diagram and diagonal and diameter and diarrhea even. That, those words are related. I, I'm, I'm bringing this up is because when you put into um, Google Images the word digraph, you get all of this teacher's pay, teacher's stuff. And it's, it, it really, there's a lot of confusion out there. And I think it's really worthwhile um, getting that language across, that it's not diagraphs. And digraphs are not uh, in consonant clusters like G plus L. So in this bingo here, this is being called consonant digraph goldfish bingo um, and unfortunately that's it, it's really confusing and again 
for the kids that come to see me for the canaries and the coal mine it's really confusing it's really confusing so i think we use that word digraph a lot i think we need to advocate for um some really good use of that word there's the diagraph right here in the corner um all right now the other the other reason i bring digraphs up and i've done a free webinar on it called digraphs in depth so that's available on my website um the other reason i bring it up is because digraphs two letters one sound and word final e are two different things and yet i see this language um, where word final e is called a split digraph and i do advocate against that um, and i think there are good linguistic reasons to advocate against that so here are some um, examples of digraphs and yes that last one uh, has is has an e there and here's an example of some of the things that word final e signals so it's a marker it signals certain pronunciations um, and so on i don't think it's a good idea to lump them together so i'm i'm, I'm a staunch advocate of not saying split digraph but i've gone into that more in depth um, in another webinar but there we go another thing that i wanted to tackle and this again is on the subject of two is blends as well there's a lot of writing about blends and i, I I'm, I'm glad of that there's a lot of um there's definitely a bit of bit of movement uh, about what blends are and i wrote a um i wrote a piece on that as well called round the blend sometimes it's worthwhile to advocate for a reduction in the use of something and i think a good candidate to reduce is blend as a noun this is a blend that is a blend and we all live and learn in my first book i used that term blend as a noun we all live and learn like i say i'm not here to ridicule anyone or to be elitist about it i just think that we get a better deal if we're really clear about what a blend is or sorry what blend actually means the technical term for two adjacent consonants that go together and are said in quick succession uh, in a syllable is a consonant cluster. Uh, sometimes the word blend is used interchangeably with digraph and that's where we get problems. And I've even heard the word, I've even heard the phrase vowel blend, um, which I think is somebody saying vowel digraph. So can you see how we do need to separate out those, those different strands and advocate for that that clarity of language because it's a very very common term and it's misused a lot um, blend as a verb should remain and that's actually one of the keys to synthetic phonics <laughs> and we'll, we'll we'll go we'll do a tiny bit on synthetic phonics at the end although i think i'm probably preaching to the choir when i talk about synthetic phonics but there you go I do want to bring up David Kilpatrick because obviously he and LDA have a wonderful relationship and David was over last year um, promoting and talking about uh, his new book Equip for Reading Success. One thing that David and his cohorts uh, has managed I think to get across very well LDA all of the professionals uh, in the field uh, who are concerned with the science of reading one thing that they've managed to get across really well is phonological awareness we're almost all agreed no matter what side of whatever fence it is that you're sitting on um, we're almost all agreed that it's important uh, to have phonological awareness and it's quite easy to understand what that is it's much easier to understand phonological awareness than it is to understand orthographic mapping or um, cognitive load theory you know it's a good one it's a, the one that we can get hold of um, and it's easy to teach it as well. So you can actually change and, and enhance a person's phonological awareness. And that's great too. But Kilpatrick also said, he also said last year, there are other things that we need to be getting right. There is other language that we need that are crucial as well to get right. And he was very specific about that. So I want to go over a couple of the terms that Kilpatrick also, I think, um, uh, wanted us to be be aware of and, and used really well. The first one is sight words. There's a misconception that sight words are words that have to be memorized by sight. Of course, all you LDA consultants know that that's not true. Um, however, that's the misconception. So the misconception is that they have to be memorized by sight. There's also a misconception that sight words are somehow words that contain something other than the expected grapheme. So if you have a word like, um, oh, I don't know, uh caught 
Some children will spell it C-O-R-T because the expected grapheme for that OR sound in the middle is O-R. That's the most common grapheme that represents that phoneme. Um, however, as we know, it's A-U. Um, and then there's the lexical G-H in that word. I'm not going to go into COT tonight. But um, the misconception is that that somehow should be a sight word. Don't pay attention to its structure. Just learn it by sight somehow. Um, those are the two misconceptions out there. What Kilpatrick recommends as a definition that we should all be carrying about sight words is this. I'll let you read that while I have a drink of water. All right, so everybody read that? Yes. Good. Marvelous. Thank you. Yes, and he said that last year as well in his uh, in his talks in Australia. So it's a word, it doesn't matter if it's supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, it doesn't matter if it's the word straight or the word chumley or fanshaw spelt in those weird ways, right? A sight word is a word instant. You're not sounding it out, you're not guessing. That's a sight word. As opposed to irregular words. So they get, they, again, those terms get used interchangeably and I think we need to advocate for not doing that. There's a misconception that irregular words are words that are not spelled according to logic. Now, as you and I know, all spelling is logical. <laughs> it is, it is, it just needs to be explained well. It's logical. So in fact, in my view, there aren't, there aren't such things as irregular words, but there are words which are spelled without uh, going to the, you know, the expected grapheme, like caught, right? The recommended definition that Kilpatrick talks about is words that cannot be easily sounded out. Words that cannot be easily sounded out. So a child in their first few years, um, having not learnt the extended code yet, and not enough about etymology and morphology, may not be able to sound these words out according to what they've already learned. That's a good definition of irregular words. Kilpatrick talks also about what written words are and their meaningful strings of letters. I think that's a good quote from Kilpatrick too about all of this. It's all meaningful. It's just that the meaning may not have been explained yet and so we can call them irregular until their regularity is pointed out. All right, so that's irregular words. I'm going to end up very shortly. I'd just like to talk a tiny bit about phonics. We all know what phonics is. That's absolutely fine. And in fact, there's a lot of um, move, movement in schools to teach phonics and there are uh, companies falling over themselves to produce phonics things and phonics packages and so on. The mark of a good phonics program is one which is systematic. And I think it really is important for us to uh, advocate for this systematic bit. If you're using phonics, is it according to a system? Do you have a system? Do you know where you're going? What's your scope? How do you know when you've actually delivered what you need to deliver to these children? Um, is there a sequence? Do you know what, what order uh, would work best for the largest amount of people? That's what systematic phonics is. And of course, synthetic phonics, does your instruction contain modeling and coaching of blending and segmenting, blending as a verb, segmenting as a verb. So do you coach them to put these um, uh, graphemes according to the phonemes of their spoken language into um, larger and larger constructions? Does, is there enough coaching doing that? And that's what systematic and synthetic means with phonics. Those were the, that was my last word because here's the thing, this is not an exhaustive list. I, I'm, I'm happy to discuss more about ideas about what else is important to really make sure there's a good, um, that teachers really have that accurate meta language. Because what's the point? Why do we care about that anyway? Well, for some, and these are your LDA kids, these are your children that are in contact with LDA, the families that are in contact with LDA and LDA consultants. Clarity and consistency are crucial. Clarity and consistency across all the educators that they come in contact with for all of their school years is crucial. It's very, very easy to confuse a person with a developmental disorder of language literacy. So clarity is crucial for them. Clarity and consistency 
is crucial to help steer educators towards best practice. And that's what we want to do as well. We want educators to be thirsty for what works best for the largest amount of people. Clarity and consistency helps with that. The other thing is you're judged on your linguistic output, whether you like it or not. So the way you talk <laughs> and the, uh, the clarity with which you talk and the consistency that you have with the field, um, you are judged by that. And so again, as advocates, a, uh, a clear uh, advocate is a trustworthy one. And I think that's, that's a really good um, method of advancing and supporting the aims of LDA and, uh, and institutions like it. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, and it is now time for, um, for questions. That was a lot of talking and you've been very, very kind um, to, uh, to, to even have your eyes open at this point. I can see all your faces and it's really lovely. Um, so what we're going to do, Felicity, you uh, asked a question. I'm just going to escape out of my other screen. So I hope I don't cut myself off here. Um, nope, still there. All right, um, Felicity, you said, is there a good order to teach consonant clusters from a speech? An ability to pronounce. Wow, oh, that's a really good question, Felicity. I love that question. It depends on who you've got in front of you. Um, but the way that I lay it out um, is uh, I have students generate their own clusters. So what they do is they take the consonants in the alphabet and they generate um, via, by, via this process of here's the first consonant. Does this form an acceptable cluster in English? Yes or no. So we do that until we get to the first cluster. And then we do example words of that. So I have them generate that alphabetically. That's one approach. I'm not saying it's the only approach or anything like that. Um, and the other thing about teaching consonant clusters is I wouldn't teach them as pieces of code. You know, like um, there are some programs that have PowerPoints where, right, we're doing blends, here we go. Bull, cool, full, dull. <laughs> That's a whole lot of new code. It's a whole lot of new code to learn. And again, for our population, it's not sustainable at all. So um, the other thing with the speech and ability to pronounce, well, the thing about word initial consonant clusters is that they do have, you can generalize in that, in the secondary position, you've usually got some sort of lateral consonant. It's not not usually um, it's something you know like quite easy to pronounce and again we're going from from small to peak sonority with clusters as well and also on the way out as do, do you know what I mean so mm, d, mm, t, that's going to happen um, in, in in consonant clusters and I get my students to figure that out for themselves hope that answers your question Felicity well I see a smile so that's good um, what are the exact words that you use for describing the sounds that letters make in a word? Sounds that letters make in a word. Um, well, I use the term um, grapheme. Those are the letters. And I use the term phoneme. Um, although, again, I'm not, um, I'm not against going and this says, oh, and I know there are definitely some schools of thought that say, don't ever say, 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 represent or whatever. I don't know. I, 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 um, I don't get that picky with it. Maybe I should. Again, I'm open to correction if I have to be. Um, I'm fine with that. My goodness. I'm, you know, 20 years ago, I had very different meta language. Um, the definition of noun is another that I wish could be stoned. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, the de oh, a noun, a person, place, or a thing. I'm not sure which definition you mean, Amanda. Um, I hope that answers your question, Jack. Um, Claire, is it easier to learn beginning or ending clusters? Don't know. I don't know. I've never really thought about it. I don't think learning clusters is a good thing. I think being able to pronounce and transcribe clusters is a good thing. Um, but the further, I, I guess, from a cognitive and working memory perspective, the further on you get in a word, the harder it is to perceive it if you've got working memory issues. So I would say the end of words are hard, beginning of words are slightly easier, which I think maybe is why balanced literacy and whole language do have a lot of concentration on that first 
part because it is easier to perceive. That's my theory. Um, hope that answers you, Claire. Kylie, thank you. Um, as a school looking to change completely how we teach reading to synthetic phonics, ooh, um, there are a number of programs, but where do we start? Oh, I, you know, there's a lot of really good phonics programs on the market, absolutely brilliant ones. Got Little Learners Love Literacy here in Australia, absolutely brilliant, a fine body of work done by a very, very professional organization. You've got Sounds Right, hugely popular in Australia. Um, yeah, I like those two a lot. <laughs> They're really good if I was gonna pinpoint anything, but there's plenty, there's plenty. There's Letters and Sounds, which isn't a program, but it is a framework from uh, the United Kingdom, um, from the, the, the government there, which is really very good. Letters is awesome. If you could get letters training, you're laughing. Spalding, I'm trained in Spalding. I love that thing. A great program. Depends. It depends. Um, MSL is expensive. Yes. Uh, MSL, in my, in my, I might have this wrong. I'm not MSL trained, but um, is that not a remediation program? Is that really a synthetic phonics program from start to finish with a scope and sequence for early literacy instruction? There's, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's great. Look, there's two things that we've always got to consider when we're buying into programs. And one of them is, um, uh, how, how does it raise teacher capacity? If it actually makes you think about language, it's a good program. And I know MSL makes you, you have to study that stuff. And it's really good. Um, whereas one that you can buy off the shelf and just, um, you know, like a, a reading mastery, spelling mastery, these are really good as well. They don't force you to think quite as hard. And sometimes that's an advantage if you need to hit the ground running. So I don't know. There's lots out there. Um, oh, so, okay. So Jack, sorry, I'm referring to when I am teaching OU in a word, for instance, I'm on the edge of my seat, Jack. I don't know what the for instance is. From, I'll, I'll come back to you. From Chris Guy, one of my school's SSP program teaches ink as a diagraph. Oh, yeah, read, write, ink. <laughs> right? I bet you that's what it is. I'm trained in that as well. Uh, what do I think about that? Well, um, in, in, in my view, there's two places of articulation there. And I'm not, uh, yeah, I do question that. And I've never had a satisfactory answer from Ruth Miskin. Um, so I kind of don't use it. Um, there are degrees of accuracy in all of this. Uh, Jennifer Reeve, I've always taught that every syllable must have a vowel sound. Well, it has peak sonority. So it's mostly vowels, but look at the final syllable in bottle. It's not a vowel sound. Or it could be a schwa. You could actually transcribe that, schwa L, or L with a um, bar underneath it to show that it's a, um, What's the word? Syllabic consonant. So I've always taught that every syllable must have a vowel sound. That would mean discussing inserting a schwa sound. Oh yeah, yeah. Into the um of chasm before the, yeah, between this and the um with the student. Can you please comment? Is there a better way? Um, well, here's the thing. With those um, ism words like chasm and um, schism and, and, and so on, I would, I'm happy to approach that sort of thing from a vocabulary point of view. Um, I do teach schwa, and I think it's an important part in a sequence of teaching and learning that schwa is understood, that that mid-central relaxed vowel in an unstressed syllable is understood. Um, and so therefore, if I've taught schwa, awesome. Um, I teach the consonant plus L syllabic consonant syllable as a type of syllable. Not that I'm into syllable types so much, but within the framework of final silent E being that signal where orthography and phonology interact with one another quite strongly, I teach it there. Um, that's all I can really sort of say on that. Um, you would take it, I suppose, case by case if it's not part of your system. So if you're using a system that deals with that, awesome. That's really good. Uh, Claire is saying Hegarty. Yes, I know that Hegarty does do some work with um, consonant clusters that some people have been questioning. But because I'm not across all of the Hegarty materials, 
Um, I can't comment too much on that. Perhaps someone else would like to. Again, it's a good phonological awareness scope and sequence, so it's got that going for it. Um, not sure, very hard to find out. From 08101923, nice name, PLD, <laughs> PLD Literacy Western Australia has a program that has a scope and sequence from prep to grade six. Cool, I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> I'd like to see it. So that's, um, is that um, uh, widely available? Is that something that's a PDF that people can access? Um, initial lit from multi lit. Oh, absolutely. Gosh, I can't believe I didn't mention them. See, that's the problem with mentioning programs by names. Of course, all the lits, anything from Macquarie University, high, high quality stuff. Um, I did OGMSL training with Ron Yoshimoto, lucky you, Kate, and that was for whole class. Right, small group and one to one to one. Amazing training, but yes, expensive. I suppose you get what you pay for. Ron's good. Um, Sarah, MSL and OG both have clear scope and sequences. Good, that's the information I wanted. Hi, Sarah. Are the programs you name suitable for older learners? Can you recommend an excellent phonics program that is not presented for younger students? Don't know, Daryl. I think there's be, there'd be lots of people on here that would, would have really good advice about that. So I'm happy to take suggestions from them. MSL is an approach rather than a program. It uses synthetic phonics. Oh, cool. That's good, Wendy. Thanks, I have had the teachers cover it up. I'm not sure what you mean, Chris. Zoe B, MSL wouldn't be good for someone starting out. You have to make all your own resources. Ah, okay. Yeah, as they say, it's a, an approach, not a program. All right. Uh, Felicity, OG teaches ink, ank, onk, and probably ing, ang, ong, then, as a letter pattern. Depends again on the meta language. Meta language. I mean, I, I do do quite a lot of work on the all family with children, A-L-L. -L. That's not one it's not one phoneme and I, and, and I don't um, ever say that it is, but by golly, there are a lot of common words with that letter pattern. And I do do work on that because I want them to unitize that as a letter pattern. That is something that I do work on. Um, Monica, it must have a vowel spelling, apart from in words like rhythm and chasm and so on. But yes, but sometimes we swallow the vowel sound into a syllabified sound. Hooray for teaching schwa. Yes, you're right, Monica. Um, and a plug for sounds right. Thank you, 08517210. Um, Sarah, Hegarty is great for whole class. Yep, cool. Yes, Hegarty is good for whole class. I have heard that. Um, Chris, we use PLD scope and sequence for spelling. Great, I'll get onto it. Zoe, have seen amazing results from using Hegarty. I'm so glad. Um, all right, questions. I'll go with questions because I'm just reading out comments now. Um, okay. Do you, does anybody, does anybody want to say a voice question? If you do, there's a put your hand up thing or look, I don't care, I trust you all, just unmute your mic and ask a question. Whoever makes the most noise, it will go to you. So if you would like to say something, now's the time. Ooh, quiet. Are you still there, Michael? You're awful quiet. I, I'm still there. Oh, good. I'm, I'm trying to be quiet, I don't want to disrupt everybody. You're really good. Um, there is a guest with their hand up, but I'm not sure whether they want to say something or not, because their hand's been up for the whole thing. It's you again, um, 08101923. Are you from Star Wars? Uh, anyway, your hand's still up. So what I'm gonna do is unmute you. If you would like to um, ask a question, go ahead. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> It's me. I just don't know what I'm doing. That's all. <laughs> when you say me, I can't. Um, my name's Karen, and I work in Mildura, in Northwest Victoria. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I was the, the came in as my edge mail number. So. <laughs> that's why. You are. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Karen. So yes, we work with um, we've we started using PLD resources through our whole. Well, we're starting with Prep One to start with, and we've got decodable text. We've got very low kids in prep who are more like kindergarten. So we've got started with the early years now so that we're starting with that before they get to even reading. So um, because they're not ready. So we're doing all the phonological awareness stuff and it's really starting to show progress. Wow. Considering 
low kids. Like we'd have 70% of our kids at really, really low. Fantastic. Yeah, so it's really good. It's, and it, it's very, um, it has a really good scope and sequence right through to grade six, which is good. It's like it covers pretty much everything. She provides webinars and lots of the stuff as well. And who you know, is she? Her name's Diana Rigg. Oh, right. Yes. So, yeah. Hot flight stuff. <laughs> so you probably do know of it. <laughs> but, but yeah, um, so we've, we're very happy with what we've done so far. It was a big change. We had to do a lot of work to get things moving. But it's going to slowly seep through the whole school. Hopefully we just need some more whole school training, I think, for the linguistic side of things to make sure everyone mm. announce, uh, pronounces things correctly and sounds and phonemes, phonemes correctly. We're working on that. <laughs> we've got a full-time speechy as well at our school, so which is really good. Can recommend that more highly for. Oh school. no, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sorry I had my hand up the whole time, but you know, I don't. I didn't know what I was doing for Zoom. I know what WebEx is, but I'm not good on Zoom yet. Don't worry. Right. Thank oh, you. Lovely to hear from you. Thank you. Um, anybody else with any out loud questions? It's go for it. We've got about four minutes, um, and then it's dindings. Well, Michael, I don't know. I think there's some, we may have answered all the questions or tired everybody out, or uh, we just have a, a 112 shy people. Who knows? Who knows? Um, did I have some form of announcement? No, I can't remember now. Um, oh, yes. Uh, so this will be recorded. Um, and um, oh, this is being recorded. And uh, an upload of that will happen on well, I'll, I'll send the link to LDA and I'll put that on my website if LDA doesn't mind. Here's what you have to know about this, right? It takes ages. It takes ages. So when I finish this, um, Zoom just, it takes so long, especially if people are streaming stuff in my household, right? So it takes a really long time. Then I've got to watch it to make sure that it, it's all okay. So that takes a while. And then I've got to convert that to an MP4 and that takes a while. And then I've got to upload it to YouTube and that takes forever. So the best thing to do is check back with LDA, check back on my website. It will be uploaded possibly before the end of the weekend, barring any cataclysms, but there's no guarantees in life. So there you go. The, um, the, the PDF of the slides, that'll go up quickly, but not tonight. I'm off to have my din-dins. Um, so if that's it. Thank you. Thank you. No, I just thank you, Lynn, on behalf of, of the group uh, for a wonderful session tonight. And we really appreciate you giving up your time uh, like this. And um, as you said, the, the recording will be up. We will have a YouTube channel uh, live in the next few days for LDA. And, and all of the uh, weekly recordings will go up there. Um, as I said at the start, every Wednesday at, at 6 p.m., uh, we will be putting on a webinar with a variety of speakers. So um, but thanks so much, Lynn, for being our first and to everybody for attending tonight. Thank you so much. My great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. And thank you, Michael. What a great admin you are. Do you want to know? Oh, not really. I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm a very nervous admin. Believe me. Um, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't press the wrong button, so I was happy about that. I know connectivity was good. I think. I hope it was good on everybody's end. Yeah. Um, I think we had Dan. about 130. 130 um, at peak sonority, huh? At peak. Yeah, that's right. Because some people sort of went out. A lot of, quite a few people sort of left but then came back in. Oh. So then I had to keep admitting them. So lucky you, you taught me how to do that because otherwise I, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So um, it's scary. Uh, yeah. But thanks so much for your time. I re really appreciate it. It's got it off to a great start, this concept and, and hopefully we can grow from here, you know, with, with some other speakers, but having you to start off with was a great coup I think for us and very kind so much yeah I'm looking forward to seeing Mark next week I hope you all come back for yeah he's amazing we'll let you go and have your dinner yeah all right Thank good you. everyone <laughs> Thank, right. You. Thank, Thank you Bye. Bye. Bye.